Uh, well, thank you, Sarah and Sarah and Patrick and the university for inviting me to come here. Um, a little cold for me, I'm a California boy, but I'm getting used to it. So I'm going to um, show you some photographs while I'm talking today. Um, and between the, what I have to say and, and the photographs, maybe we can sort of build up a, an idea of what's happening to farm workers, especially on the Pacific Coast, which is um, kind of the topic for, this, for today. Um, I was invited to a conference a few years ago in Tijuana to show images of Mexican workers in the U.S. And this conference was called El Gran Mexico. And the idea is that with 10% um, of the people of Mexico living in the United States, Mexico exists here also. So the photographs documented the experiences of farm workers um, here as part of this reality check on life north of the border. And we called this show um, In the Fields of the North because if you're in Mexico, the north is here. Um, so we used the wall, as you see here, to show these photographs in the creative way that other Mexican and border artists have done. In other words, if we can't get rid of the damn wall, let's at least make it serve the needs of the people. And if Trump builds more walls, then we're going to just turn them into more places where we can show our reality and our resistance. Now what we put on the wall has become a book, this book here, um, with photographs and narratives. And the purpose of it is to show the reality of exploitation, that is how hard people work and their communities in poverty. But they also show the culture of indigenous communities, languages and dances going back thousands of years before the Spanish colonization. They show how people organize for change. And part of their culture, part of all of our culture in fact, is this culture of resistance. That is how we change social reality. I think this is a very important time to publish this book because it is a cross-border cooperative project actually between the University of California Press and the Colegio de la Frontera Norte, which is a university um, in Tijuana. In a way, this is part of our answer to Trump. As a photographer documenting, oops, I'm sorry. Um, our president says that he's going to deport two million people. That was part of what his program was when he was elected. Now, according to the Department of Labor, about 53% of all farm workers are undocumented. The work of this man here is important. He's putting food on the table for all of us. So why should he be deported? Especially since we benefit by the work that he does. But what's going to happen to his family? And if he's deported, who's going to replace him? So I want to talk about these photographs and what their purpose is. Um, Alexander Rodchenko, who was a photographer in Moscow in the 1920s, said, we must take photographs from every angle but the navel. Um, he and his fellow photographers pioneered the use of extreme angles and close-ups as a means to shake the viewer's perspective and liberate us from complacency. Um, Bertolt Brecht said that drama and art in general should stimulate people to question social reality in, in a critical way, not just to tell stories or to romanticize things. He thought that most art puts people to sleep, and he wanted to wake people up. Nacho Lopez, who was a famer, famous Mexican photojournalist, said that photography was not meant as art to adorn walls, but rather to make obvious the ancestral cruelty of man against man. What all of these artists have in common is that they view themselves as participants in the world and its social movements, and I do too. Our practice as photographers, our ability <clears throat> to move people emotionally and especially to move them into action comes from our participation. I believe that we're not objective, but we're partisan. Documenting social reality is part of the movement for social change. As a photographer, documenting poverty, migration, and deportation, um, neutrality is not possible. I don't claim to be an unbiased observer. 
I'm on the side of immigrant workers and unions in the U.S., and I share their struggle for rights and a decent life. I take the side of people in Mexico who are trying to find alternatives for democratic political change. If the work I do helps to strengthen these movements, it will be serving a good purpose. I use a method that combines photography with interviews and personal histories. And part of the purpose is what I call the reality check, the documentation of social reality, including poverty, homelessness, migration, and displacement. This is Lorena Hernandez here, who tells her story in the book of being a young single mother from Oaxaca, picking blueberries in Fresno, and wondering how much time she's going to be able to spend with her daughter when she gets home from work in the fields. When I began to work as a photographer and a writer, documenting the lives of migrants and farm workers, I took with me the perspective of my previous work as a union organizer. Carrying a camera became, for me, a means to organize for social and racial justice, the same goals that I had as a union organizer. For me, photography is a cooperative project. When I went to take photographs and interview Rufina Perez in her shack in Hollister here, I went with Irma Luna, who is a member of an organization of migrants from Oaxaca called the Frente Indígena. Irma was also a community worker for California Rural Legal Assistance, and I worked closely with both of those organizations. Advocating for social change is part of a long tradition of social documentary photography in the United States and in Mexico, and I hope that my work contributes to that tradition today. So today I'm talking with you as an artist, a writer and a photographer, and as an organizer. I've spent my life in the workers' movement, and I've never stopped helping people organize, whether it was planning the strategy for a strike, helping workers resist immigration raids and firings, writing articles, or putting photographs of workers on the border wall. The thread that runs through all of this work is the idea that we are trying to change the way that people think. Social change comes about when people change the way that they understand the world and then they act on it. If we want our movement to grow, we have to think about this all the time. Sometimes this change happens in a house meeting. Sometimes workers learn things on a picket line. In fact, that's a great school. And sometimes our understanding grows because we read a book or we see an image that makes us think. And all of these are part of organizing. I worked for many years for the United Farm Workers Union in the 1970s. And after leaving the union, I worked for a year in the fields, partly because I needed the money, but I also wanted to understand the work itself as it's experienced by people who do it. I learned Spanish and eventually married the daughter of two farm workers from the Philippines and learned a little about the history of our movement. We have a new union for farm workers in the United States today that just signed its first contract in Washington State, Familias Unidas por la Justicia. This is a remarkable achievement, a result of four years of hard struggle and very creative tactics. And I want to tell you what I've learned from them. But I want to start by talking a little bit about history because I don't think we can really appreciate or understand what's happened here without knowing what came before. So let's start with Larry at Leon. Many people think that the Farm Workers Union was begun by Cesar Chavez and that there were no unions for farm workers before Caesar. Well, Caesar was born in 1927, and Larry Leon was born in, 1920, in 1913, so they were almost a generation apart. Larry was a Filipino organizer and a farm worker, and by the time the Great Grape Strike started in 1965, he'd been organizing workers for many years. He began as an organizer for a union called Yucapawa. United Cannery Agricultural Packing House and Allied Workers of America. That was the Farm Workers Union of the CIO in the 1930s. And it was a very radical union, full of left-wing activists. Many of them were Filipinos who worked part of the year as farm workers in California and then part of the year in the fish canneries in Alaska. They supported the struggle in the Philippines as well, where they came from. Remember, it was still in those days a U.S. colony and they supported the movement for independence. And for that, the U.S. government tried to deport its leaders, accusing them of being communists. That's who trained Larry at Leon, and that's why he was such a radical figure in the history of the farm worker movement. Yucapawa was destroyed by the Cold War, but the local union survived, and today is part of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union in San Francisco. 
Filipinos kept organizing with other radical Mexicans. Ernesto Galarza started the National Farm Labor Union in the early 1950s, which was broken in a strike against the world's biggest grower of the time, the Georgia Corporation. Then the AFL-CIO set up the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, and Larry became its main organizer. Then in 1965, two big things happened. Galarza, Cesar Chavez, and others got Congress to end the Bracero program, which growers had used to break unions and strikes. And those radical Filipinos, understanding that the timing was right because of that, went out on strike first in Coachella and then in Delano. They asked the Mexicans to join them, and after waiting two weeks, Cesar, Dolores, and the rest said yes. For the, un for the union's first five years, Chavez and Itlion were co-leaders. Filipinos brought radical politics into the union and even connected it with the fight against Marcos and the martial law in the Philippines. By then, those Filipinos were getting old, and the UFW and young Filipino activists from the cities and the universities built a retirement home for them in Delano, Agbayani Village, to honor their contribution. The UFW, at its height, in the late 1970s, won elections involving 120,000 workers, and maybe 40,000 of them wound up under contract. The union strategy had two pieces. First, it organized big strikes, 1965 to 1970. That was the grape strike, 1969 in the lettuce and salinas, 1973 again in the grapes, 1974 in the lemons in Arizona, 1980 in the Imperial Valley. Whole valleys would go out on strike. In the second piece, workers organized a boycott. They couldn't stop the growers from bringing in strike breakers, so they appealed to people not to buy the grapes or the lettuce or the gallo wine. Caesar didn't invent these tactics. This is a movement of hundreds of thousands of workers and their families. And we know the big names, but there were many people. People like Pete Velasco here, another Filipino manong who stood out in front of stores around the country to appeal to people in the cities. Jose Luna organized the big wine companies, Almaden, Paul Maison, Christian Brothers. Chuy Villegas and Oscar Mondragon organized the lettuce companies. Oscar went to prison for burning buses at the border during a big strike in 1970, the buses they were trying to load with strike breakers. Jessica Govea and Virginia Rodriguez were women who grew up in the fields and became organizers. The boycott probably owes more to Virginia Rodriguez than any other single organizer. There are too many people to name, and Caesar would be the first person to say so. The important thing to remember is that social change on this scale is the product of the movement of many, many, many people, not just a few leaders. So what did people win? Well, they won bathrooms. When women needed to go to the bathroom before, they went to the edge of the field and other women would surround them, holding up their coats to give them some kind of privacy at the edge of the field. We won pesticide regulation and medical and pension plans. The union eliminated the power of labor contractors by setting up hiring halls. And getting rid of the contractors meant that women wouldn't have to suffer sexual harassment in order to work or in order to ensure that their husbands worked. And this came about through the negotiation of union contracts. By working with its allies, the union got California farm workers. Um, the union got passed the California's farm labor law. And for all of its faults, it's still the only law in the United States that makes it illegal to fire a farm worker for organizing and sets up a process for voting and forcing growers to negotiate contracts. And this upsurge led to other farm workers' unions. The Washington State farm workers who organized the winery Chateau Saint-Michel, still the only kind of union wine that you can buy on the shelf. Cata here, we see in this picture here, mushroom workers in Pennsylvania, the Comité de Apoyo para Trabajadores Agricolas, FLOC, the Farm Labor Organizing Committee in Ohio and now in North Carolina, the Texas farm workers, the Florida farm workers, the Coalition for Immokalee workers, all of these were products of this upsurge. After I left the UFW, I went on to organize for other unions, and then in the late 1980s, I began to work as a journalist and a photographer. And part of what I wanted to do was to show in words and images what I'd been hearing and seeing as a worker and as an organizer. For instance, trying to explain the dirty tricks of the growers against workers, company unions, 
plowing up the crops in order to punish workers so that they wouldn't be able to work, firing workers for joining the unions, these kinds of things. And I also began trying to show who is working in the fields today and what it's like for these workers. I began a project that was called originally Living Under the Trees because we were trying to document the lack of housing for workers and then it finally became this book here in the fields of the north. Now this was the period of the rise in importance of indigenous farm workers. There are about 2 million farm workers in the United States nationally and 700,000 farm workers in California and that number is actually increasing. Of these in California, about 165,000 people are indigenous, meaning people who are coming from towns that have cultures and are speaking languages that were very, very old before uh, the Spaniards and the Europeans arrived in um, the Americas. So people are speaking languages like Mixteco or Triqui or Purepecha or Chatino or others. In fact, there are 23 different indigenous languages that are spoken in Pacific Coast agriculture. The proportion of farm workers from Oaxaca and in southern Mexico grew by four times in less than 20 years, from 7% of the workforce to over 20% in 2008. We saw this first in California and then in states along the west coast, and now this surge of people from Oaxaca and southern Mexico has reached Florida and North Carolina and even states here in the Midwest. Migration from Mexico was put on steroids by NAFTA and economic reforms. The number of mi Mexican migrants grew from about 4.5 to 12.5 million people. Only about 5.5 million of those people could get visas to come here, so 7 million people came without them. Many, if not most, Mexican young people see their future now in terms of migration to the U.S. The Mexican government and the U.S. government cooperate on policies that prioritize profits and investment over high wages, jobs, or high farm, high farm prices. And the big fight in the Mexican left today is over the right to stay home. In other words, the right to some alternative to forced migration. Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador was mayor of Mexico City, and he may be elected president. He's actually much higher in the polls now than on Peña Nieto, Mexico's president. And if there's not another fraudulent election like the one that robbed him of his election victory, um, he'll be next, the next president in 2018. If you read what Andres Manuel talks about, he talks about forced migration and what has to happen in Mexico to give people a future with jobs and good prices for farm produce. Whether he wins the presidency of Mexico or not, and whether that movement in Mexico advances or not, it's going to have a big impact here. We're going to see the results of that here in the United States. Part of the purpose for negotiating NAFTA was to allow U.S. agribusiness corporations to sell their products in Mexico and to use subsidies that they received um, in the U.S. to undercut Mexican prices so the Mexican farmers couldn't sell what they produced. So NAFTA let huge U.S. companies sell corn in Mexico for a price that was lower than what it cost farmers to grow it. Those companies, Archer Daniels Midland, Cargill, Continental Grain Company, they get huge subsidies from Congress and they use those subsidies to sell corn at 19% below the U.S. cost of production in Mexico. Mexican imports, corn imports went from 2 million to 10.5 million tons from 1992 to 2008. So hundreds of thousands of Mexican farmers couldn't make a living and some of them are living in communities that have been growing corn for thousands of years. Oaxaca is where corn cultivation started. We owe the fact that we're able to eat corn at all to those communities who over thousands of years discovered how to domesticate it, and yet those Oaxacan farmers are having to leave those communities and come here in order to survive. Juan Romaldo, a high school teacher in Oaxaca, who's the binational coordinator of the Frente Indígena, says migration is a necessity. It's not a choice. 75% of Oaxaca's 3.5 million residents live in poverty. 45% of its students don't finish elementary school. According to Fernando Ortega, who is the state coordinator of the Democratic Farmers Front of Chihuahua, we became impoverished, these are his words, we became impoverished and dispossessed, and the government abandoned us and excluded us from development. By negotiating the treaty, 
the government promoted violence and the growth of organized crime in all the rural parts of Mexico. So when you read those stories about the narcos um, in the papers, think about what will happen. Think about what they call in Mexico the descomposición social, the social decomposition that had to happen in Mexico in order for this to grow up and where the um, responsibility for that lies. As a result, by the government's own estimate, 40% of Mexicans live in poverty and 20% in extreme poverty. And despite the promises that were made when NAFTA took effect, that statistic has may, remained virtually unchanged for the last 25 years. So, we have to assess what Trump means when he says he wants to renegotiate NAFTA. Is he planning to stop U.S. auto companies from building cars in Mexico and importing them or exporting them from there to the U.S.? You know, the auto industry in Mexico and the auto parts industry in Mexico employs more workers now than employ in the United States. Every flat panel television is made that we have sell and we buy here in the United States is made in Mexico primarily or in some other country. Renegotiating NAFTA isn't a bad idea if it means prohibiting the kinds of measures that have caused this kind of displacement. But is this what Trump has in mind? We need to decide for ourselves what NAFTA did to us on both sides of the border and then what changes we need. And then we have to figure out how we can win those changes, especially in a political climate like the one that we have now. So the people who were displaced, what did they find when they got home? Or what did they find when they got here, rather? At the end of the 1970s, California farm workers were the highest paid in the U.S. with the exception of Hawaii's long unionized sugar and pineapple workers. Today, people are trapped in jobs that pay the minimum wage and often less and mostly unable to find permanent year-round work. In 1978, when I worked for the United Farm Workers, I helped to negotiate a contract with Sunworld, which is a large um, citrus and grape grower. That contract's bottom wage rate in that year was $5.25 an hour. At the end of the 1970s, workers under union contracts in the lettuce and the wine grapes were earning even more than that. And at that time, the minimum wage in California was $2.90 an hour. If the same ratio existed today, with the state minimum today in California of $10.50, farm workers would be earning the equivalent of $21 an hour. That's what this man who's picking grapes here during the union campaign a few years ago to organize a union in VBC Vineyards was trying to get back to. Today, farm workers don't make anywhere near that. In 2008, demographer Rick Mines conducted a survey of 120,000 migrant farm workers in California from indigenous communities in Mexico, Mixtecos, Triquis, Purépechos, and others. One third of those workers reported earning less than the minimum wage. In other words, growers were paying an illegal wage to tens of thousands of farm workers. And the case log of California rural legal assistance is an extensive history of the battles to help workers to reclaim illegal and even unpaid wages. The median income of a farm worker family in California is $22,500. And that's, think about trying to live on that. But the median income of an indigenous family is $13,750 a year. So not only is that impossible to live on, but you can see right there the structural discrimination that exists on this side of the border against indigenous people. Most indigenous families live crowded in apartments or rented houses or trailers. In some valleys, people live outside in shacks, in tents, or even under trees or sleep in fields, or in the case of this man here, under a bridge. In recent years, the price paid to workers for picking a flat of strawberries has hovered around $1.50. Now each flat contains eight of those plastic um, clamshell boxes. So a worker is getting paid a little bit less than 20 cents to fill each one. And that same box is selling in a supermarket here in Madison for what? What does it cost to buy one of those clamshell boxes of strawberries in a market here? Eight dollars. Eight dollars. Whoa. Well, I'm... In California, it's four, so you folks are paying even a lot more than that. So you can see that the workers are getting what? They're getting 5%, 4%, 5%, 4%, 5%, 4%, 5%, 4%, 5%, 4%, 5%, 4%, 5%, 4%, 5%, 4%, 5%, 4%, 5%, 4%, 5%, 4%, 5%
4%, 3% of what it is that um, we are paying um, when we buy it in the store. Which means what? If the price of that clamshell box that these workers here have just picked increased by five cents, which was a suggestion that was made by the UFW and the, um, I'm sorry, um, during his campaign to organize Watsonville strawberry workers in the 1990s, those wages would increase by 25%. And most workers, um, most consumers, that is us in the stores, we wouldn't even notice that. You know, if you paid, the what's the difference between $8 and $8 $8.05? In fact, the price of that box, of, of that um, clamshell, plastic clamshell box in the stores, it varies by much more than $0.05 cents, you know, from one week to another anyway. And so could growers afford it? You know, that's what they're always telling us, that if workers, farm workers' wages are going to go up, we have to get used to the $10 head of lettuce or the $15 basket of strawberries, right? Well, you know, produce sales in Monterey County alone, which is sort of the strawberry capital of California and the world, really, amount to $4.5 billion every year. So tell me there's not enough money. And these low wages, they have brutal consequences to people. When the grape harvest starts in the eastern Coachella Valley, the parking lot of a small market in the farm worker town of Mecca is filled with workers who are sleeping in their cars. Rafael Lopez from San Luis, Arizona here, was living in his van with his grandson, and he said, the owners should provide a place to live since they depend on us to pick their crops. They should provide living quarters, at least something more comfortable than this. In northern San Diego County, many strawberry pickers sleep out of doors on hillsides and in ravines. Every year, the county sheriff clears out some of their encampments, but by next season, workers have found others. As Romulo Munoz Vasquez, who is living on a San Diego hillside, explains in this book here, there isn't enough money, he says, to pay rent, food, transportation, and still have money left to send to Mexico. I figured any spot under a tree would do. So this young woman has to figure out how to give her son a bath while she's living in a tent, how to keep milk cold for more than a few hours in the cooler that we see next to it. And compounding the problem of low wages is the lack of work during winter months. Workers have to save what they can while they have a job in order to tide them over. In the strawberry towns of the Salinas Valley, the normal 10% unemployment rate doubles after the harvest ends in November. While some people can collect unemployment, 53% of farm workers have no legal immigration status, so they're barred from receiving benefits. Yet people have a strong community ties because of their shared culture and language. Farm workers in California, as I said before, speak 23 different languages, come from 13 different Mexican states, and have rich cultures of music, dance, and food that bind those communities together. Migrant indigenous farm workers participate in immigrant rights marches, and they organize unions. This is Ramon Torres here, the leader of the new union for indigenous farm workers in Washington state, Familias Unidas por la Justicia, talking to a strike meeting in a labor camp. The communities of Mexican migrants living in California are increasingly made up of young people. The typical age of somebody crossing the border today is about 20. Many young people, even children, work in the fields. But you can also see old people in the fields too, like Ermila Lopez here, who was 65 when I took this picture in Chowchilla. Nobody has a pension unless they're one of the few people that worked under a union contract. If you're undocumented, you can't get Social Security, even though they've been taking it out of your paycheck for your whole work life. So I take photographs that show the tents and the shacks of farm workers in Santa Rosa ravines cooking dinner on a fire outdoors within sight of the chateau-like wineries that depend on their labor. Farm labor is also dangerous. At least 16 farm workers have died of heat exposure in California fields since 2005. In the last four years, indigenous workers have been demanding a change all along the Pacific coast. Four years ago, I got a call from Rosalinda Guillen to come up to Washington State to cover a strike that had started at Sukuma Farms, two hours north of Seattle and an hour south of the Canadian border. That strike 
led to the formation of Familias Unidas por la Justicia. Conditions in the treatment of Sakuma farms were like those in California before the UFW. Rosario Ventura here, who was one of the strikers, here's how she describes what her life was like in the labor camp. She says, we were upset about the conditions in the labor camp. The mattress they gave us was torn and dirty, and the wire was coming out and poked us. We're accustomed to sleeping with the children, but the bed was so small that we couldn't even fit on it. There were cockroaches and rats. The roof leaked when it rained. They just put bags in the holes, and it still leaked. All my children's clothes were wet. Rosario's story went across the country to help the public understand. This is what I call activist journalism, because I participate in this movement as an organizer and as a journalist. And the workers at Sukuma Farms began boycotting the company's berries using the tactic that had been uh, pioneered by the UFW in the 60s and 70s. Ramon Torres, who became president of Familias Unidas, he said, at first the boycott was against Sukuma, and we were able to get their berries taken off the shelves in the markets. And then we saw in the fields that the boxes of the berries didn't have Sukuma's label on them anymore. They had the Driscoll berries label instead. Driscoll's is the largest berry distributor in the world. It doesn't grow its own berries, but it controls berry production and it contracts with growers in over five countries and has received loans guaranteeing foreign investment from the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, which is an agency of the U.S. government. Marketing berries has become highly monopolized. During the peak season, Driscoll moves 3.8 million pounds of fruit every day. At the same time, workers kept striking in the fields to force the grower to raise the peace rate. These strikes helped keep workers together and were like a school for learning about collective power. One of the strikers, committee member Tomas Ramon, who we see in the photograph here, he says, we, didn't wa we don't walk out of the field because we just feel like it. This is the only way that Sukuma listens to our demands for pay that is fair for our labor. And that's why we need a union contract so we can work and not have to call work stoppages just to get a fair wage. And Ramon Torres says, we didn't have any other way. And strikes helped develop people's understanding that if we had a union contract, we'd be stronger. Even if we want an increase in the peace rate one day, the company could lower it again the next day. So it was a way for us to win over the people. And the union used legal action to keep pressure on the company and to put money in workers' pockets. Last year, Sukuma Farms had to pay retroactively $87,000 to pickers after the Supreme Court ruled that peace rate workers had to be paid for 10-minute rest breaks. And in a class action lawsuit that was brought by two of the workers at the farm um, alleging pay violations, Sukuma Farms had to pay out half a million dollars. On September 12th, last year then, workers finally voted in an election to demonstrate what really needed no proof which was that they supported the union that they had formed in 2013. Those votes were counted in a local schoolyard by a man named Richard Ahern, who was a former regional director of the National Labor Relations Board. This is very ironic, because farm workers were excluded from the National Labor Relations Act in the 1930s, and yet here was a former director of the NLRB, the agency that administers the National Act, running the election anyway, and helping him was Jeff Johnson, the head of the AFL-CIO in Washington State. That was the power of the workers and their allies at work. And the result, 195 votes for the union and 56 against it. And everybody knows that the reason why Sukuma decided to negotiate was pressure from Driscoll's, who wanted the boycott to stop because, and because they needed a dependable supply of berries. These walkouts were organized by a 35-member union committee of workers in the field and another 25-member committee helped to shape their anger over conditions and proposals for a union contract. The union in Sukuma also settled on a mechanism for making the contract even more likely, which was a date for the conclusion of bargaining after which, if agreement wasn't reached, those offers each on each side would have to be submitted to an arbitrator, and the arbitrator would choose one proposal that would prevail. Now, California has a law that's called mandatory mediation with virtually the same arrangement. It was signed into law in 2002, and it's been used by the United Farm Workers in California to get contracts with several large companies. But this law, was, which is now on appeal before the state Supreme Court, is being challenged by a company called Garawan Farms in Fresno, 
one of the world's largest peach growers, with the support of Howard Jarvis and a whole um, host of right-wing people in Washington, D.C. But the first place that we had any arrangement like that was in Washington State, even before California. Rosalinda Guillen came up with it to help workers win a contract at Washington's largest wine company, Chateau Saint-Michel. That contract was signed in 1995 and is still in force today. And then she went to work for the UFW in Watsonville and then in Sacramento, where she took that idea with her and started getting it passed into law. And then Rosalinda went back to Washington and started organizing farm workers into an organization called Community to Community. And when the workers went on strike at Sukuma Farms, she was the first person that they called to ask for help. The Familias Unidas workers all expect that their movement is going to move beyond Sukuma Farms. Ramon Torres says, we already have members in other ranches who want the same things that we do. In California, the same workforce of indigenous workers from Oaxaca is starting to protest the same conditions. A year ago, 450 blueberry pickers in McFarland near Delano went out on strike. According to one of the workers, Paulino Morelos, he says, the majority of the people here are from Oaxaca, Mistecos and Zapotecos. The foreman humiliates us, and he's always pushing us to work faster. Another foreman says, Oaxacos are no good. Now, Oaxaco is a derogatory term um, used to describe people from Oaxaca, indigenous people. At the beginning of the blueberry picking season, this company was paying pickers 95 cents a pound for blueberries. And think about how much you're paying again in the supermarket for it. By mid-May, that price had dropped to 70 cents and then to 65 cents. And finally, the company announced that it was dropping the price again to 60 cents, and that's when workers refused to go in to pick. And after they stopped work, they got in touch with the United Farm Workers, who helped them to get an election, and they voted for the UFW 347 to 68, and last month the union finally signed a contract with the employer there, a company called Gourmet Express. Today, a number of the organizers for the United Farm Workers come from indigenous communities. One of them, Aquiles Hernandez, was a teacher, and he belonged to the left-wing caucus in the Mexican Teachers Union called the Coordinadora. He remembers organizing a planton, that is, an occupation-style encampment outside the Secretariat of Education in Mexico City. He says, three of us were fired because we were active in the protests, and I was in prison for 72 days. So this is the kind of experience that people are bringing with them to California. Another organizer was Concepcion Garcia, a Mixteca immigrant. She understood the pressure on strikers because it was part of her own history. She said, I worked in Sinaloa, another state in northern Mexico where workers go as migrants from Oaxaca to work in um, export farms. She says, I worked in Sinaloa when I was a kid, starting when I was nine years old. I've seen a lot of kids in the fields, a lot of need and suffering, so I love teaching people about their rights. This year, the UFW succeeded in getting overtime pay for farm workers like other workers. Again, farm workers got excluded from the national laws that um, set up overtime pay for most other workers, making California the only state in the United States that has a law that mandates um, overtime pay for farm workers. And the reason why we got it is because the children of farm workers are beginning to get elected as representatives in the communities where farm workers live. A Filipino is the mayor of Delano now. That would have been unheard of in 1965 when the strike started. Chicanos and Mexicanos are the leaders in the legislature who won the overtime bill. So organizing the union brings political change. For over a decade, I've worked to document this with the Binational Front of Indigenous Organizations, the Frente Indigena, with California Rural Legal Assistance, and with Community to Community up in Washington. Our project, which led to this book, shows extreme poverty. It shows the lack of housing for many people and the systematic exploitation of immigrant labor in the fields. But through these photographs and the accompanying oral histories, and there are 10 narratives of people in the book here, migrants also analyze their situation and demand respect for their culture, for basic rights and greater social equality. And here we see Jose Gonzalez, the leader of the Frente Indicana in San Diego, urging workers who are living under trees on a hillside to come to the big May Day march in 2006. That's the one where they had 100,000 people marching in San Diego and a million people in LA. 
By showing people as active participants in changing their world, like these workers at a union meeting in Healdsburg, these images and words push back against rising racism and anti-immigrant hysteria. They provide an opportunity to present people as complete human beings, people with the ability to struggle to survive and to change those conditions. Out in the fields, we take images that show the work in a way that asks the viewer to think what it's like to labor bent over all day, practically running down the row of vegetables. Growers kept women like this from doing this job of cutting lettuce for many years because it paid a little better. Only men were hired and women had to fight to become lettuce cutters, that is for the privilege of working bent over like this all day. This project is an attempt to help people understand the reality of migration from the point of view of migrants themselves. Migration is a complex economic and social process in which whole communities participate. Migration creates communities. The function of these photographs is to help break the mold that keeps us from seeing this reality. And it's often a very beautiful one with a culture that includes weaving and dance and music and food. In Greenfield, three key farm workers organize dance festivals, including one here at the public library. We have over seven delegates of dance festivals organized by immigrant communities throughout California, like the one here in Santa Cruz. And culture isn't static. An indigenous culture in the US is being changed and reinterpreted as a result of migration. Young indigenous people like Ray Guzman and Miguel Villegas are changing their own culture. And here we see them performing the first Mixteco rappers in the US. By using this combination of photographs and oral histories to connect words and voices to images, the voice of these women strikers in Washington state helps to capture a complex social reality as well as their ideas for changing it. The hands of this worker are also hands that can struggle. And with the threats made by the Trump administration of deportations and walls, struggle is inevitable. This is the new generation, sons and daughters, of strikers at the gate into the labor camp at Sakuma Farms. They saw what their mothers and fathers were doing and they made their own picket line, fighting for their own rights. And when they made that homemade sign, Justicia para todos, they knew what it meant. They knew what they were fighting for. And 10 years from now, they're going to be the new organizers of our movement. As a union organizer, I help people to fight for their rights as immigrants and workers, and I'm still doing that as a journalist and photographer. I believe that documentary photographers stand on the side of social justice. We should be involved in the world and not afraid to try and change it. The words of Rosario Ventura are the last ones in the book. And what she says is in both English and Spanish so that the book can be used in both countries and in the communities of farm workers and migrants themselves. Rosario says, when I told my dad I wanted to come to the US, he tried to convince me not to leave. When you leave, he said, it's forever. That's what he said because we never return. You won't even call, he said. And it did turn out that way. Now I don't talk with him because I know that if I do, he'll ask, when are you coming back and what can I say? I would like to return to live with him since he's alone, but I can't get the money to go back and there's no way to earn money in San Martini Tunoso. I thought that I would save something up here in return, but it's hard here too. We work to try to get ahead, but we never do. We're always earning just enough to buy food and pay rent. Everything gets used up. He said, she says, they always try to make us afraid to speak up. If you ask for another five cents, they fire you. They fired Ramon because he talked back to them, but thank God he had the courage to talk. We can't leave things like this. We're making them rich and making ourselves poor. I think these things can change if we all keep at it, but we won't let them keep on going like this. This struggle never stops. Now workers face another use of immigration law against their efforts to organize. Growers are constantly searching for a low-wage workforce impervious to unionization, and now they're concentrating on expanding guest worker programs under the H-2A work visas. This federal program allows growers to recruit workers outside the country for periods of less than a year, after which they have to return to their country of origin. Their wages are locked at the bottom, and they get deported if they organize a union or they go out on strike. Last year, 
Growers brought in 165,000 workers like this, and next year is predicted they'll bring about 200,000 people. That's 10 percent of the entire farm labor workforce in this country. One reason why the strike started at Sukuma Farms was that the company fired all the strikers and tried to bring in guest workers to replace them, and the strikers fought and defeated that effort. Those guest workers and the strikers, they're all migrants. But almost all the migrants who make up Familias Unidas have been living in the U.S. for many years. Like Rosario Ventura, they cannot go back to Mexico and then cross the border to return to the U.S. They're here for good, despite the threats of deportation. So organizing the union at Sukuma Farms is part of putting down roots in northern Washington. Workers won their contract because they knew what they wanted and they know they need to stay. They need jobs and they need homes. They have families here and people are looking for a better future for their kids. It's not a temporary job. People are part of this community. They're not strangers. They're not outsiders. In the atmosphere of hysteria and enforcement that the Trump administration is generating, workers need the ability to defend themselves, but the larger community also has to organize to stand with them. No matter what Trump says or how many walls he builds, he cannot change this reality. People are here to stay. Farm workers are going to keep fighting until the conditions that they live and work in are not just like other workers, but until all workers have the basic dignity that their workers earned them. That's it. Thank you. I'm going to turn a few of the lights on just to give us a little bit of Let's do that. <laughs> so, anybody have any questions or comments or things you want to say about it? Like the pictures? So, I think you made well the point that um, as bad as Trump is, this is a phenomenon that um, really continues from one administration to the other. NAFTA, of course, was done under the Clinton deal, um, which suggests that um, there's really a need to change the whole system, right? There's a need to change the way things are in this country and the way people in other countries are forced to live in poverty, whether in their country or here. So I just wonder if um, if you have like a bigger vision, or you know, like, can you share with us um, some idea of what to do, how to do? Um, how can we change this damn system, you know? Well, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've been mulling it for many, many years. Me too. Me too. Um, well, we're going to talk about this more tomorrow as well, too, because tomorrow we're, you know, we're going to talk about immigration enforcement and where it comes from and what sort of describe the system, what I call the labor supply, the labor supply system of imperialism, and describe it um, in broader strokes here. What we're looking at here is a piece of it, um, really. Uh, be, and it's really the piece that involves people coming and working in the U.S. as farm workers and, and the way the agricultural system in the U.S. Um, depends on that labor. And this is a historical fact. In California and on the West Coast, there was never a period in which we really had small farms. You know, labor, agriculture in California was always capitalist agriculture. So it depended on huge irrigation projects. You know, the Central Valley, the San Joaquin Valley was a desert, really. Well, I shouldn't say that because it actually had very, a, a lot of wildlife and it was a, must have been a very beautiful place. But it was very dry. And in order to farm it, um, water had to be brought in by huge <coughs> irrigation projects. Um, railroads had to be built to take the produce to market. And then workers had to be produced. And although, you know, under the mission system of the Spaniards, um, those missions were kind of agricultural projects in miniature, um, they 
did enslave the native people, and you know most native people in California died as a result of that. Um, when when agriculture and this new agricultural system developed and expanded, um, they needed to produce the workforce that would um, make it productive. And so from the very beginning, workers were brought from somewhere else. So the first farm workers in California came from Japan. And then California passed um, the alien land law, which prevented um, those Japanese farm workers from owning land and settling down and becoming farmers themselves, which, you know, people always fight against all of this. And eventually, those Japanese farm workers and their families, um, a generation and two generations later, were able to become landowners and growers themselves. Um, then the Chinese, they brought the Chinese in originally as railroad workers and workers who drained the delta um, in the San Joaquin Valley and made it into productive farmland and then became the workforce. And they brought in Filipinos from the Philippines. And, you know, that was a really uh, a terrible system because the people who were brought to the United States were only men. Um, U.S. policy basically prevented the migration of women from the Philippines. And mis anti-miscegenation laws forbade those men from marrying and from having families of their own. And so the growers had this... Um, workforce made up of solely of workers without any families you know, to get in the way that went from labor camp to labor camp to labor camp. That was where Larry, what Larry, Larry Leon came out of. He was part of that. Um, Mexican workers, you know, came in. And, you know, of course, remembering that, you know, California originally was part of Mexico, but nevertheless, you know, the, the Mexican workers who wound up in the fields were not um, somehow the sons and daughters of the original land grant landowners. They were overwhelmingly people who came out of Mexico um, during the revolution and during the early 1900s and have been coming ever since then. So it's wave after wave after wave after wave. African Americans coming in from the East Coast who became the um, farm workers, um, especially in the cotton when cotton was still harvested by hand. There was only one brief time when um, there were white farm workers in California, and that was during the years of the Dust Bowl. And, you know, Steinbeck wrote the book about it and so forth, but that was really only from about 1933 or 34 till the beginning of World War II. And when the war industry started, those people went to Los Angeles, they got jobs in defense industry, or they became soldiers. And uh, there were still some white people in the fields after that, but generally speaking, you can sort of see what is happening here. So this is the system. It's not a um, an old feudal system that somehow led to um, land reform and people having their own individual plots of land. It was always very, very, very large scale capitalist agriculture that depended on a flow of migrant labor. And that's, in a way, it's the source of the, it's, it's the source of us, our families in California. If you talk to uh, many, many, many um, Chicano and Mexican families in California. Um, people talk about their grandparents who came as Braceros during the Bracero program and then walked away from the program and found a way to live until 1986 when they got the amnesty and um, generation after generation comes around. So, you know, this is also the story of the working class of California and where we came from as people. Um, but what a terrible cost, you'd say, right? You know, I, I think that's in part what you're saying. Here we live in a system that, 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 that treats people like this. And of course we want to change it. Um, I think, though, it's a very interesting question. And again, tomorrow, we'll, I, tomorrow we can get into it more and you know, on Thursday even more. But you know, let's say that it wasn't capitalist agriculture any longer. Let's say we had socialism in California. How would agriculture function? And would migration of people end? You know, I'm not sure that migration, even though we can sort of see that the migration of people is very much a product of displacement, whether by war or by poverty or by trade treaties, you know, all these things are aspects. In fact, they're not just 
there in, in a way aspects of how the system functions. But um, the system needs labor and it produces labor in response to the need and this is how it does it. You know, let's say we ran the system. You know, would the migration of people stop? I kind of don't think it would, partly because, you know, we can move around the world now in a way that we couldn't do that 200 years ago. And we also have families that are connected now. You know, the, these Oaxacan families are, are a great example of it. You know, you can go from Oaxaca to Sinaloa to Sonora to Baja California to California to Oregon to Washington to Florida to, and I'm sure even Wisconsin now. And you will find family members, you know, people from your hometown. So what does that mean? That means that if we, had, if we had control of this situation, we would want people to be able to move back and forth as freely as possible because that's what people want to do. You want to be with your family, right? Why not? And what stops it is the fact that the system isn't functioning um, according to the needs of our families. You know, we had an uh, immigration law passed in 1965, set up family preferences, right? That was the only time we've had an immigration law that recognized that we were people with families and that that should be the major determinant about how people go through borders and go from one country to another. Other than that, it's all been driven by the labor supply. So um, maybe that gives us some idea of what we might do um, if we had the power to change the system. But of course you start out by asking how do we do that? That's a political question. How do we get enough power to upend this system and put in its place a new one? I'm just going to leave that one on the table here for a while. And anybody else that wants to you know, get into that, welcome to it. I just wanted to comment and, uh, and thank you for you know bringing the, and show those photos. My name is Pedro. I'm a Madrid labor inspector for the state of Wisconsin. And I just wanted to mention that it's a little different, you know, California from Wisconsin. Here in Wisconsin, there's been some progress. I mean, not huge, but you know, like in housing, you know, migrant camps are better than you know uh, 20, 30 years ago. Good. Uh, I can tell you that we enforce, you know, the uh, work agreements, you know, so kind of like the union contracts, you know, so. Uh, but very interesting uh, what you mentioned about the indigenous uh, workers. I still encounter people from Oaxaca, you know, the Mixteco, Zapoteco, you know, that. Uh, our department is uh, looking into translate, you know, the uh, Mixteco, you know, because there is, there are, you know, uh, for workers to, you know, uh, to know the uh, Wisconsin migrant labor law, so. But very interesting, you know, your documentaries. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. And you know, we have, um, there's a, uh, a teacher, a migrant education teacher in Watsonville who um, wanted to have something for the children in the classes. And so he produced the first trilingual children's book for kids who are learning to read that's in Misteco and Spanish and English. So, um, you know, I think that. We're trying to do that too in California, same, the same thing. And I, I don't want to present a point of view that says that nobody is trying to change you know, the conditions, especially for housing and labor camps. California, I think one of the things that might make California a little different from Wisconsin is that California did have labor camps all the way up through the 1960s because growers had to set them up, especially for those Filipinos, but for other people as well too. Um, and then when the UFW, when workers organized the union, growers began tearing them all down. And I think, personally, I think this was social revenge by growers. I think growers were saying, essentially, you want to organize a union? Fine. Find your own place to live. We are not going to give you a place to live any longer. Um, so you had some of the federal labor camps that were set up in the 30s, Kerry McWilliams and um, Paul Taylor. And then you know, there are some that are still left. And workers, of course, are fighting to try and make those, the conditions in those camps better. But we have this enormous lack of housing for migrant workers. That is the biggest problem. And so that's partly why people are living under trees, is that 
there is no housing for migrant workers in a lot of rural California. And then what housing there is is so expensive that workers are saying to themselves what Vargas was saying here, and that is, um, you know, I, I have to choose between paying rent or sending money home. And if I'm going to make that choice, I'm here to send money home. And I can live under, I can, I can live with living under a tree for a while if that enables me to send money home. And it's the way people think also to themselves. They think, I'm not here forever. I can deal with anything for a limited period of time. I'm here for a purpose. And so for the length of that time, I'll, you know, in a way, it's, it's sort of not always contributes to people <laughs> fighting to get better housing. But, um, but that is the problem. That is the problem that we have here, think, at least in the West Coast. Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. It really motivated that. But I know you work also with the Colegio de la Frontera Norte and that. And I want to ask you, have you been invited to present your work in Mexico? And what would be the response especially now that we're having an upcoming election and we have the candidates like, like Mari Chui from the Consejo Nacional Indígena and López Obrador. Well, what would that mean in terms of the right to, right to stay? Well, um, yeah, I want to give enormous credit to COLEF, the Colegio de la Frontera Norte, for um, being willing to publish this book. It is practically impossible to publish a photography book in the United States these days. Um, so the only way this ever got published was because Kodef agreed to publish it. And that was partly because it grew out of that conference that they had with those photographs that were on the wall. And so they sort of had a commitment to it and they got interested and then I came along and said, let's do it. And they said, yeah, okay. And, um, and they did. And they actually designed a really beautiful book and they put way more photographs into this book than I ever thought they would. I thought for sure they were going to tell me at one point, at some point, well, cut the number in half, or cut it, you know, by two thirds, and, and we'll do it. And they never did. You know, they published it the way I gave it to them. Um, and then, after they had designed the book and everything was sort of already there, then I went to an editor that I've worked with before at the University of California Press and said, "Well, how about you coming in on it so that we can sell it here in the United States as well as in Mexico?" And they did. And Naomi Schneider was the editor there, and to give her credit, you know, they did their, their, their bit. But the initiative for it came from Kolef, and I think they deserve the, the real credit for this. Um, and it has, it's gotten a lot of attention in Mexico. In fact, it just, the book just got given the, um, the National Prize from the Instituto Nacional de Antropología and Historia. So, you know, it's getting some recognition. Um, in Mexico, and um, there's a show that goes with it, and that's starting to tour around. We just did a, um, a tour along the border, and so to me it's always really interesting. I've worked a lot along the border over these years, and especially when you start showing photographs of um, life in the fields in California, people are going to come up to you and say, oh yeah, I know that place. You know, I was there. You know, oh, my uncle is in Fresno. You know, it's like I think every family in Mexico must have family members or friends that are living in the United States now. So 10% of the people, you know, it's like, it's such an enormous fact of life. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean, though, that people are all anxious to come to the United States or are all thinking about the United States all the time. I think, actually, people think about their own country and what's in front of them, and then there's this added layer on top of it. You know, here in the United States, we tend to think that Mexicans must be obsessed by immigration because so many Mexicans come here, and I don't think that that's necessarily the case. Um, but it does affect the political system in very important ways, and, and you pointed to, I think, what to me is, is the most fundamental way, and that is that... Um, I first heard this in Oaxaca at meetings of the Frente Indígena, people talking about el derecho de, que, de, el derecho de no migrar. And the, el derecho de no migrar means um, the right to an alternative, that migration should be voluntary. So it's always paired also with el derecho de los migrantes. 
So if you do leave home and you come to the U.S., you should have rights. You should have equality in the United States, but you shouldn't be forced to do it. You should be able to say no. Well, being able to say no means that you have to have a future where you live, right? If you're a kid, that's what, you know, Juan Romaldo, the teacher in, in um, Huxlavaca is saying when he says that, yeah, that there's no alternative. And he says, you know, here I stand up in front of my students and I tell them that it's important for them to go to school and try to go to the university and get an education. And they're looking at me and I know that they're thinking that their uncle or their brother is working in a field or a packing plant in the U.S. and making more money than I make as their teacher standing in front of them. So, you know, I think this is really, you know, a big contradiction for people. And so, derecho de no migrar means that, the, that a student in that classroom has a reasonable future in front of them if they decide to keep on living in Slovakia or Oaxaca City or wherever. Um, what does that mean? Well, jobs, it means good farm prices. But to get that, given what the policies of the Mexican governments have been for the last 30 years, it means political change. You can't get that, get there in Mexico without having political change. Well, I think you could then say, okay, and we can't get there either in this country without having political change here. You know, we are so dependent on each other that, you know, I think it's like you were saying, you, know, you want to change the system. Now we're talking politics. Now we're talking about how do you, how do, you do that. Um, but in the, when, when, when Andres Manuel was running for president the last time, he began making speeches about um, the right of people to a future in Mexico. And I think any indigenous candidate, Marichui or you know, the last campaign of the Zapatistas, uh, La Otra Campaña, um, is also talking about the same thing. In other words, political change, economic change in Mexico for Mexicans, so Mexicans can stay in Mexico and have a decent life. Um, and that is a product of migration. You know, so I think it's going to be very transformative, and I hope to hell that Andres Manuel wins the selection. I mean, I'm, well, I shouldn't make a political speech. But <laughs> I mean, I, I love the candidacy of Marichui, and I think that it's great that an indigenous woman is running for president of Mexico, but I think that there's also a certain political moment here, which is the possibility of knocking the PRI and those technocrats out of power in Mexico City and making broader change possible. And so I hope it happens. I hope it happens. And I think we have a stake in that here. Because if it does happen, we are going to feel the repercussions of it. And if it doesn't happen, we're going to feel the repercussions of it too. I just, all the conversation got me thinking and wondering um, what, what Esti, right? Was asking of how, how, how do we change it? How do we fix this? I, I'm Mexican, so I don't think that just um, getting rid of PRI or PAN will solve it all. It's much more than that. It's like reconfiguring what economic development means. If, if we keep thinking that economic development means more money, it, it will never end. It, this will never end. What does economic development mean? How can the first world be called the first world? If they have such poverty, if they allow such poverty, right? It, and this idea of having to produce for the sake of producing and paying ridiculous wages to have the strawberries get rotten because the market does not pay enough for them and the producers um, prefer to just throw them away instead of paying, instead of paying um, fair wages. For example, all of this has to be reconfigured, and capitalism will not be the answer for that, of course. Socialism? I don't know. I don't think so. There's been other economists that have been bringing up other ideas, right? I remember there's some a Chilean economist that used to be a professor at UC Berkeley. Um, I can't remember his last name right now. That it would, it would travel um, several times to South America in general, and, and that's when he started thinking, what does economic development mean? Why am I coming 
on a regular basis to try to figure out the way or to tell them the way that, that they should develop, these countries should develop their economy to become more prosperous as those in the United States or in Europe, when this is much more than that. Um, and he has written many things, and it's called Barefoot Economics. So that's one approach to And he left UC Berkeley. He's, he's a Chile living, but he's still alive. So it's, it's one of those things that if, if we don't see this more as a that system, that we need to rethink it, how to do it. Of course, it does have politics involved. How do we trump the system, the economic system, if we don't bring the politicians that can do it? Thank you. I have something I want to say on this too, but I, I think if there are other people that want to ask a question or say something, let's give people a chance. Um, so after just kind of like um, your presentation and the reflection of like how these migrant workers coming to the United States are being paid like these little wages to be able to, to pick these berries, pick these fruit for these big companies, then I feel like there could be an argument and I want to know what you would think that this current state that the Mexican economy is in, that where it has many of its, like its population crippled into poverty, so that they're forced to migrate into the United States. Would you say then that like the current state of the Mexican economy is very beneficial for the United States in terms of like their grower economy? Completely. And that's that's one way, but there are other ways too in which the Mexican economy is, you know, functions for the benefit of 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 US corporations and those people who run our economy here. I don't necessarily think that it necessarily functions for the benefit of farm workers in the United States or working people in general here, but it certainly functions for the benefit of, um, of those people who control the benefit from the economy here. And it's been a process in which they have, have taken control of the Mexican economy in order to do that. You know, I think that, you know, the, um, again, you know, tomorrow we can talk some more about it, but when they passed the uh, um, Immigration Reform and Control Act in 1986. They set up a commission, Congress set up a commission, which recommended the negotiation of a free trade agreement, and then said that, uh, well, although it might raise incomes in Mexico over the long haul, it's going to cause dislocation and terrible economic costs in, you know, in the short run. And of course, the long haul never arrived in the short run is still with us. But what I'm saying here is that um, they knew before they even started negotiating the, the, the treaty what would happen to people in Mexico as a result of it. So then you have to ask yourself, then was the production of displaced people in Mexico part of the reason why they wanted the treaty? Maybe it wasn't a politically acceptable reason to say out loud, but it was certainly something that they knew would happen. And since we have all these industries in the United States that are dependent on that labor, um, and that you know profit off it to such an immense degree, then um, you know they knew who they were they knew who they were benefiting, and who would reap the benefit of doing that? Who would pay the price, and who would? Uh, reap the benefit of it. You know, it's, um, uh, it's part of the way imperialism functions between the U.S. and Mexico. And, um, and yes, it absolutely does. It's, it's sort of, and it, it's also, you know, there's, a, the, the more you sort of peel the onion, the more you see other ways in which it happens. You know, the grower that, that um, is paying the low wage to the strawberry worker is also not paying the social costs of producing the strawberry worker, right? In other words, the, um, it's not just that they are profiting by the strawberry worker showing up at the edge of the field saying, I'm ready and here and able to work for, you know, whatever it is that you're going to pay me. It's that the, the grower is really dependent on San Miguel Cuevas and Santiago Rubaca sending people into the fields 
from those communities. Because if that flow of people stops, then what is the grower going to do? In fact, growers are now negotiating in Washington with the Trump administration about you know, essentially telling Trump, well, if you're going to really shut down the flow of undocumented people into the United States, you have to give us a labor force. So give us guest workers. Give us more interest. In fact, there's a bill in Congress right now, Goodlatte, one of the most anti-immigrant members of Congress, who has proposed a very expanded guest worker program now called H2C. So, you know, this is very, very conscious, you know, in terms of what they're doing. But that grower, you know, what is the cost of, to Kuslawak or to San Miguel Cuevas, of producing people? Who pays for paving the streets? Who pays for the schools? Who pays for the healthcare system? Who pays for whatever it is that people are getting there? Workers pay for it. It's the remittances that are going back to Mexico from workers. So instead of the grower sending money to Mexico saying, thank you, Huflawaka, for producing workers this year, send us more next year, and here's uh, you know, so much money to pay for the cost of doing that, the workers themselves, out of that money that they can't live on here, are also having to pay for that cost as well, too. So it's a very, very cheap system for the grower here. You know, when they say that the immigration system in the United States is broken, you have to say, well, broken for who? Because obviously some people, it's not broken at all. If you're a strawberry grower in Watsonville, it's not a broken system. It's a very good system. It's a very cheap one. But if you're the worker in that system, or if you're the community that people are coming from, it's a very, very, very exploitive, brutal kind of system. I think we have time for one more question. Okay. okay. Thanks. <clears throat> so I've been, I've been grading papers all day, and um, the assignment of the essay was to write to the speaker of uh, the Wisconsin Assembly about AB 190, which would fine um, local communities who don't cooperate with ICE. And what I've been struck by in the, in the students' essays, or not all of them, but, but, but a surprising number of them is the ability to hold simultaneously. I mean, these students are figuring out how they feel about these issues and writing about them. But simultaneously, this idea of wanting justice and wanting better treatment and the idea of people working hard and deserving and simultaneously these narratives of criminality and undeservingness and, and not deserving like citizenship. And it seems like the, the guest worker permits thing sort of uncomfortably resolves if, if these two things are able to be held. I mean, your narratives like really help address that first one, just like humanizing and, and talking, but, but the other narratives, the negative narratives, um, Does this? I, I guess I'm, what I'm saying is, how how do you how does your are you thinking in your work? Because you are thinking about addressing the other side of it that would then that would then help address. Well, we don't just want to treat people well under the guest worker programs, but there's also there's like something more to it than that. Um, yeah, I, it's not exactly a well-formed question, but I've, I've been struggling with this all day thinking about like how, how these multiple ideas are being held at the same time. Well, again, come back tomorrow, but... Okay. <laughs> um, you know, well, you know, the argument for guest worker programs from its liberal defenders, not that, you know, the conservative def defenders simply say, well, growers need a labor force, let's give it to them. Um, the liberal defenders say, well, would you rather have people dying crossing the border, you know, walking through the desert? You know, and of course we do have hundreds of people that die every year you know, coming across the border the way they are. Um, so the first thing is, is that we have to really be much better educated. We have to educate ourselves about what the reality is of these, of these programs and of the life of undocumented people. In the book here, you know, I have a little section that's about this labor camp where you have undocumented people and H-2A guest workers work, living together in the same labor camp. And you listen to them to speaking, and you hear, you know, the, you know, one person say, you know, how they feel, and, the, and what you get, what you get at the end of it is you can see, first of all, that how little difference there is from the perspective of the worker. How sometimes 
the undocumented worker has certain advantages because if you're an H-2A worker, you can only work for the company that brought you, and if they don't have work for you, then you just sit there twiddling your thumbs until the work comes again, and if you're undocumented, you just go and find a job somewhere else. Um, on the other hand, you know, H-2A workers don't have to live in fear of the migra all the time. But, you know, there's other aspects of it, too. All I'm trying to say is that we have to look at what the reality of it is and what, it, what happens to us and what happens to farm workers. Why did the workers at Sukuma Farms fight that H-2A program as hard as they did? Because they knew what the grower would do with it. So, and, and the grower did do it with it, and they were fortunately able to defeat the grower with the aid of their allies. But, so we have to really understand to be able to, to see through the bullshit that gets used to defend these programs and that also gets used to defend the flow of, of undocumented labor. That's a really brutal system too. So, and then we have to be able to say, well, okay, if, if we don't like either one of them, what is it that we want? What do we want, right? And assuming that, at least for the foreseeable future, people are going to continue to come, the real question is, how should people come? You know, should people have legal status when they get here? Of course. Should people be equal? Of course. How do we get there? What is a, what kind of, that's what the law in 65 was working towards, although we could get into a long discussion about whether it really worked and whether it works now and what about waiting 25 years for a visa for your brother in Mexico City and all the rest of it. But nevertheless, I think that we have to have a, um, a perspective on what the reality is and then what the alternative is. But, you know, when you start your question, you were really talking about how do, how do people hold these contradictory ideas in their mind at the same time, where you say, I want, all, I want everybody to be equal. I want people to have justice. I want people to have a decent life and be able to live free, securely with their families and, um, and not be ground into the dirt. And then the same person saying, and those fucking illegals, you know, they should just go home. Or they're just here to take our job. Or they're just here to get welfare. Or, you know, one thing after another. And I think what it is is that, um, that people have different places where they are getting their ideas and their traditions from. And the first one, I think, comes from a very healthy place, which is people's sense of equality. You know, we had a civil rights movement. We have a labor movement. We have, you know, these movements that have changed life in this country for the better for working people and that have these ideals that they function under and that get, um, you know, diffused into our, among people as a result of it. You know, the civil rights movement changed the way people in this country thought about racial equality, for instance, right? And that's real now. It's a part of the way people think. And then people get another whole set of ideals and ideas from where? From, you know, Trump and the school system. Not, I mean, I think that's a, a complicated question too. But people do get, you know, ideas out of, you know, the kind of education that they get. And they certainly get it from the media. And I think that this is in part where, you know, th there's a big argument in this country about whether racist ideas, for instance, or anti-working class ideas are sort of a natural part of what people get because of who they are and where they come from in the society and the idea of privilege, or is it something that comes externally from the media that you're exposed to? I think these are complicated questions and we have to sort of figure them out, but all I'm saying is that I think that there are healthy places where your students are getting their ideals from, and then there are pretty messed up places that people are getting their ideas from. And so it's not like they're equal, of equal value, right? I mean, if I was a teacher, I wouldn't be telling my students, well, all these ideas are legitimate ideas and, you know, um, you should feel free to think what you want. I would argue for one against the other, right? And then try and, try and get people to see this contradiction. How can you say 
that you believe in equality or you believe that working people should have a decent life and then tell me this. Mark up those papers and every time those nasty ideas show up, you go, wrong! <laughs> I'm not thanks. a teacher though. All right. All right, thanks very much.